come from Earth, a planet of outlaws. What master do you serve? What master do I serve? What am I supposed to say, Jesus? When the Earth starts to settle, God throws a stone at it. Hear me, and rejoice. Upon this rock, I will build my church. You have had the privilege of being saved by the great Titan. How is humanity saved if it's not allowed to evolve? We're fulfilling the prophecy. I hate this prophecy. Wakanda forever! In the Marvel Cinematic Universe, who is portrayed as the enemy of our soul? I am. We're in the end game now. Hey everybody, welcome to LED Live, where we are going to expose some darkness with the light of Christ. And you guys aren't going to want to miss this one because we're going to talk about the Marvel Universe and their end game. And if you're a Christian, I believe that there is a reason why the world has totally become obsessed with this movie. $1.2 billion in its opening weekend is out of control. Find out on this episode of LED Live. Light exposing darkness. All right, you guys, have you ever seen a Marvel film? Probably. Yes. You okay. probably have. Okay, I've, seen, I've, I have. I've <laughs> seen some of the Marvel films. Yeah, right. It's been <laughs> a long time since I've seen them. But, you know, I, I think that they were brilliant in the way that they were literally roping together all of these stories and collecting sort of audiences in each one of the categories and then converging them all together in a final story. I mean, it was just a brilliant idea for a company. Yeah, kind of like yeah. a flavor for everybody. Uh, yeah, <laughs> You're going to identify one of these comic exactly. characters probably, right? Exactly, yeah. exactly. Do you guys remember from Replacement Gods 1 when we had um, the artist that was talking with Grant Morrison and he basically said, listen, this is a recreation of the Bible? Yeah. You guys remember that? Mm -hmm. I really believe there's a reason why we're seeing so many biblical references and um, I mean, it's pretty shocking when you kind of wrap your head around it so uh, I'm excited to present this for you guys Me too. Okay. see what you think all right all right so in order to kind of basically wrap your head around this we're gonna go all the way back to 10 years ago the very first Iron Man now there's a lot of parallels that Iron Man actually has um, biblical parallels that almost kind of pin him as the Savior you guys will check this out there's even comments that are made in the film that are directly taken from the Bible such as this one Render unto Caesar that which is Caesar. There you go. Render unto Caesar that which is Caesar, which is a line yeah. that's directly taken from? Yeah, from Jesus the Christ. Yeah. From Jesus, right? Yeah. So uh, here it is in Matthew 22, 21. It says, They said unto him, Caesar's. And then he said unto them, Render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's. So this is when Jesus was getting confronted with the Pharisees and they were asking him, you know, who do we pay our money to? And he quotes this exact line. So I found that kind of interesting. Yeah, there's another scene here where um, in the very beginning of the movie, Tony Stark is describing how his company is really uh, a company that's, that's making weapons to destroy large entities. And he titles this one with a biblical name. For your consideration, the Jericho. As you can notice, he holds his arms out in sort of a Christ-like pose, right? Now, who destroyed Jericho? Was that uh, the devil? Yeah. No. no, that was that was Jesus, yeah. right? So there's this parallel here once again with, with him being like a Christ type. When he became Iron Man, this is the first time that, that he like almost dies, literally, and they take him to a, a cave, and that's where they put that little thing on his chest, and um, which saves his life. And here's, a, here's him inside of the cave. I've seen many wounds like that in my village. We call them the walking dead. So he makes a reference that he's like the walking dead, which is another Christ-like yeah. type reference, right? Yeah. But he's in the cave for three months, being, three. <laughs> becoming Iron Man, right? Of course. Yeah. And he comes out of the cave, literally blowing people away and destroying them, right? So we start to see now a stark contrast of if this is really like a Christ type or a savior of the world, 
Is that really something that Jesus would do, right? Come out of the cave and start destroying life? The Bible says this in John 10:10 10, 10, that a thief cometh not but to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. The very purpose of Jesus was not to hurt and destroy people. In fact, yeah. he spent most of his time running around healing people and helping them, right? Right. When um, you analyze the comic books, um, there is uh, some references even in the comic drawings that he's just like Jesus. In fact, this is Tony Stark here. And as you notice, he's in a very Jesus-like pose. This is actually a sculpture of, um, of Jesus and Mary. Yeah, that's and not a coincidence. It's not a coincidence. And I even took the um, comic book here and overlaid it. I mean, look at this. He's even literally in the exact same pose. That is purposeful. That's what I was noticing. Her hand hmm. gesture is identical. Identical. Yeah. So I believe that this is definitely purposeful to make him like a Christ type, right? But the bad guy in the movie, as we start to uncover who these bad guys are that, that, that all the Marvel Universe is always fighting against, guys that want to take over the world or that want to destroy the entire world or half the universe, right? They have a lot of similarities to God or God's, God's, God's government. So the bad guy in the first Iron Man, his name is Obadiah. I don't want a body count to be that's, our only that's legacy. What that's what we do. We're ironmongers. We make weapons. It's my name on the side of the building. And what we do keeps the world from falling into chaos. So basically, the bad guy, Obadiah, says what we do for a living is try to prevent the world from falling into chaos, right? By destroying things with these weapons that are called <laughs> the Jericho weapons and stuff, right? Now, when you look at Obadiah's stain, Obadiah is actually Hebrew for slave of God. The biblical theophorical name means servant of God or worshiper of Yahweh. Now I find that really interesting that the bad guy is literally the servant or, or slave of God. And the Bible talks about um, Jesus as being the servant of God, right? Isaiah 42, 1, this is a prophetic interpretation of Jesus. Behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him and he shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. So I think that is not by chance that they named him literally servant of the Lord. So let's move to Iron Man 2, okay? So in order for this to be a true statement to basically say that they're, they're literally warring God against the devil, but they're kind of flipping the model around, there has to be consistency throughout all of them. Wouldn't you agree? Mm -hmm. So it's not like just one film that you're going to notice this. We've got to see this thing throughout a lot of different films. In Iron Man 2, uh, here he is. They're once again giving you the imagery that Tony Stark is sort of a, a, a Christ type, and here he's offering to save the world through the means of peace. He's in a court scene and he's um, being questioned in front of the judge. I mean, Jesus was in court being questioned, questioned in front of the judges too. And uh, we know that Jesus is called the Prince of Peace, right? So listen to this scene. We're safe. America is secure. You want my property? You can't have it. But I did you a big favor. I have successfully privatized world peace. So here he is bringing world peace. That's kind of his mission. Um, in fact, same mission that Jesus had. You have heard it said, uh, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless those that curse you, do good to those that hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, right? Jesus was the Prince of Peace. He, he came to really share how we were supposed to uh, live peacefully. So now, if, if, God, if the enemy is like God, um, and the good guys like Jesus, that seems like a good thing, right? Right, so on the surface, when you watch these and you kind of recognize, okay, there's some Jesus type parallels, but when you really analyze his character, his character is totally different than Jesus, right? He's totally this rich uh, narcissist. Did, was Jesus rich? No. Did he come to the earth in all of his wealth? No. No way. So who is the rich one in the world that can promise you anything, right? right? So even though he's set up to be like Jesus, that's more of an antichrist type character. So here the bad guy in here, Ivan, um, you can see things written on the wall. It says Tony Stark is here to save the world. And uh, Ivan is here talking about Tony Stark. Listen to what he says. If you can make God bleed, people will cease to believe in him. So he says, if you could make God bleed, people will cease to believe in him, right? 
But that's kind of the whole angle that, that the Iron Man 2 is taking. He's trying to hurt Tony Stark and Iron Man. Here's the picture. Tony Stark is here to save the world. Once again, that imagery we see popping through. This what's fascinating about that statement he just made is God did bleed, you know? Yeah. And instead of people not believing in him, people believe in him because of that. Right. So this scene right here, Ivan is in prison. Tony Stark comes to visit him in prison, which I think is very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and the dialogue that happens back and forth um, really kind of starts to begin to show you a picture of who the Iron Man really is. You come from a family of thieves and butchers. And now, like all guilty men, you try to rewrite your own history. And you forget all the lives the Stark family has destroyed. Speaking of thieves, where did you get this design? My father. I'm Tom Uncle. Well, I never heard of him. My father is the reason you're alive. So it's very interesting that he says he came because of his father, and Tony Stark goes, I've never heard of him before. And he goes, my father is the reason you're alive. Now, can the devil make that statement? No, he cannot, right? In fact, the very reason all life exists is because God allows it, right? Satan wants to destroy it all. Right? And he says to Tony Stark, you come from a th family of thieves and murderers, right? You can't, you can't make that comment towards God. He's not a thief, right? The yeah. devil's known as the thief. So there's some imagery here that really he, he has uh, um, some sort of Christianity in sort of a twisted, bent way. He wears a Maltese cross. He has these whips and he looks like he's been whipped himself. White bird on his shoulder. His name shoulder, is, like yeah, that. white bird on his shoulder, <laughs> right? Very interesting, kind Long of like hair. the Holy Spirit, right? Long hair, I mean, there's some parallels here that are very strange. <laughs> Now John 8:44 says you belong to your father the devil and you want to carry out your father's desires he was a murderer from the beginning so they're twisting your idea and perception of who's who in the story um, but listen to how Tony Stark gets psychologically analyzed and listen to how they describe him he's reading his analyzation of himself Mr. Stark displays textbook narcissism so he displays textbook narcissism, right? Mm. You can't attribute that to God. No. God is so right. others focused. In fact, he loved the world so much, he gave his son to die for those that don't even care about him, right? The opposite of narcissism. It's the devil that's narcissistic. So let's talk about Iron Man 3. In the storyline of Iron Man 3, and when they play the trailers for you, they don't show you exactly who the bad guy is. So they set it up that this particular character that Ben Kingsley played is the bad guy. And so the voice that you hear is going to be his voice. Listen to how he addresses people and see if this rings any Christian alarm bells. Ladies, children, sheep. Some people call me a terrorist. I consider myself a teacher. So, he addresses people as ladies, children, sheep, right? Mm. Those are all names that Jesus uses to describe our relationship with him, right? We are the bride of Christ, yeah. we are his sheep, and we That's are right. literally children of God, right? And he says, some people consider my, me to be a teacher, right? Jesus was a teacher, so there's some strange parallels with him and uh, Christianity. Now, in this second trailer that they put, put out for this movie, there are flashing scenes that's happening all throughout the movie, and the camera flashes through a scene where you see this character that Ben Kingsley plays. He raises his arms up in the air. And so I went back and I paused it, and I looked at what it is, says on his robe, because every time something is written on the screen, that tells me that sometime a director had to make a decision, hey, write that on there. No, no, nothing, no words are gonna automatically. Yeah, they didn't go to the store and buy this. <laughs> that's right, that's right. So this is actually made. So if you'll notice right here, what does it say right here? Redeemed through blood. Redeemed through blood. Who's, who's redeemed through blood? We are, right? That's, that's something that describes our salvation through Jesus, really. 
and they're putting this on the bad guy and he's got his arms outstretched like in a Christ-like pose. We are redeemed through blood. And in fact, the Bible has lots to say about this. Ephesians 1, 7 says, in whom you have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins and according to his riches and grace. And Isaiah 44, 22 says, I have swept away your offenses like a cloud, your sins like the morning mist. Return unto me, for I have redeemed you. I think it's beautiful that we are redeemed through Christ, you know, but they're painting him as he's the evil one, right? But the twist in Iron Man 3 is this isn't even really the real bad guy. In fact, they put him as an actor who's in prison, but he's really just an actor. He's not even like a real bad guy. So it's almost like even just another little jab at God, like, oh yeah, you came into this criminal world, but you're not really, you know, a sinner and you're not really a bad guy. I find that is is, is kind of an interesting parallel. But all of these guys that are in prison, they want to hear him do his like little dark voice that he always does. So listen to this scene and see if you see any Christian parallels with this. Uh, Me and the boys was just wondering if you could do uh do the voice. Fletcher, it's not something I would just turn on. I'm not your meat puppet. Oh, very well. (coughs) And you'll never see me coming. You'll never see me coming. coming. Thief in the night. Right? Wow. Thief in the night, seriously and he's talking to other criminals. You know what I mean? And one thing that's kind of interesting is when I actually was looking for this up in, in, the, um, in the internet just to even find this clip, they titled this clip, Hail to the King. And I think that in the film, they actually even call him the King, which is very hmm. interesting. That's probably the name of the chapter on the DVD or something. Exactly. So let's talk about Thor, okay? So moving on, different one. We show this in Replacement Gods 2, so this will be just kind of a little bit of a refresher. You guys have probably seen this before, but this scene is a a scene between Thor and his father, and this is when the very beginning, when they introduce Thor to the world, listen to the language that they use even here. I have sacrificed much to achieve peace. Thor. Through your arrogance and stupidity, you have opened these peaceful realms and innocent lives to the horror and devastation of war. You are a vain, greedy, cruel boy. And you are an old man and a fool! You're unworthy! Father. I am! And I'll take from you your power! And I cast you out! Open your eyes. Oh, no, this is Earth, isn't it? Where'd it come from? So what do you guys notice right off the bat? It's just like Satan. Just like Satan, right? He's having a conversation with with his father in heaven. His father says, "You're you're the vain, greedy, cruel boy who traded peace for war. Well, who's... Who's the epitome of vain, greed, cruelty that literally traded peace for war? Was cast down to earth in a bolt of lightning, right? Do you remember the story when Jesus was talking with the disciples and the disciples all came to him and they said, yes, we have power over the demons and we can cast them out, right? Do you remember that story? And Jesus goes, no, 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 don't, don't gloat at that. Don't be excited about that. Because he says in Luke 10, 18, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. That's why the devil's always described as this bolt of lightning, ACDC, bolt of lightning, you know, the devil's children always like, you know, kind of describe their um, occult through a bolt of lightning. It's because of this verse. So in Thor Ragnarok, there is a very interesting scene. Once again, we see some crazy parallels. It's come to my attention that you don't know who I am. To God, Jesus, the bad guy in this case is Thor's sister. I am Hela, Odin's firstborn, the commander of the legions of Asgard. Now I want you to observe something right off the bat. Look at her crown. It is literally in the design of a crown of thorns. Go back to whatever cave you crept out of, you evil demoness. 
And there's this scene where she is walking back into her throne room, Thor sitting on the throne. You can see this crown of thorns going back into her head. And she has this very interesting dialogue with Thor. Check this out. It seems our father's solution to every problem was to cover it up. Or to cast it out. I find it very interesting that she's literally saying our father's way of dealing with things is to just cover it up. But see, that's what God does. God's atoning blood through Jesus Christ covers our sins. And listen to what Thor says. Or to cast it out. Uh, we already saw that he was the one cast out, which is a representation of Lucifer. I want to point something out right here. If you notice that the symbol in the ground where she is standing is the symbol of the Trinity, you see it on a lot of Bibles, uh, that was put here on purpose, not by mistake. And then, one day, he decided to become a benevolent king, to foster peace, to protect life. The fact that she's saying that her father, the one that cast Thor out, is a benevolent king and he wants to protect life and be peaceful, once again is a description of God. Here's the difference between us. I'm Odin's firstborn, the rightful heir, the savior of Asgard. And you're nothing. The fact that she says she is the firstborn, the rightful heir to the throne, and the savior is once again another parallel to Jesus. Now, let's talk about Guardians of the Galaxy, okay? So, totally different movie, right? You're starting to see that the heroes from Marvel share a lot in common with Satan. Now, Iron Man, we brought this up earlier, right? More of like an Antichrist type character, but he's this rich narcissist. I mean, that's more of like the devil's character traits than it is like Jesus. So, Guardians of the Galaxy is a story <laughs> where you have criminals in the universe that are gonna save the world, right? They're the cast out people, the, the one that everybody hates, right? And they're the ones that are going to begin to save the universe. Now, I found this really interesting. Listen to the language that uh, they talk about describing the villain in this series. What were you thinking? Dude, they were really easy to steal. That's your defense? Come on, you saw how that high priestess talked down to us. So, the villain is a high priest, right? Here's the villain of the story, all decked out in gold. And you'll notice as you watch this clip, everything is in order. Everything is perfectly like um, symmetrical, right? And her name is the high priestess. Listen how this guy uh, interacts with her. It's the delay, Admiral. High priestess, the batteries, they are exceptionally combustible and could destroy the entire fleet. Our concern is their slight against our people. We hired them and they steal from us. It is heresy of the highest order. All command modules. So, as you notice, once again, arrayed in a very, very interesting pattern. Everything is very orderly. I mean, it's the same sort of thing if you, look, if you watch Star Wars, it's like the rebellion is sort of chaotic. You look at the Republic, everything very in order, right? So very mm -hmm. similar type setup that we got going on here. And they're called the sovereigns, which are in it, right? What does the word sovereign mean? Anyone want to take a stab like at a that? The ruler. The ruler, right? In fact, this is the sovereign. This is her, her throne. Notice there's light streaming out of it, right? God is the very source of light in, in, in heaven. I see it within you. Fear, jealousy, betrayal. It is our duty to cleanse the universe of this weakness. She even used the word heresy. I mean, that's kind of right. Heresy, jab, high priestess. But you see the little jab yeah. that the high priest is really a girl. Mm. I mean, you know what I mean? It's just like a little tiny like slam that they got to do there. Sovereign means, if you look it up on the internet, supreme ruler, even a monarch. Causing or um, possessing supreme or ultimate power. Wow. You can't attri attribute that to the devil. The devil does not have supreme power over God. Only God has supreme power in the universe mm -hmm. from a Christian perspective, right? right. You're going to hear a phrase that's very interesting. And when you hear the phrase, I actually hear this phrase pop up in a lot of Marvel movies. So here's the phrase. 
Well, to make it through that, you'd have to be the greatest pilot in the universe. Lucky for us. I, uh... I... So, in order to make it out of here, you would have to be the greatest I am. Right? Something you'll see pop up actually in a few different stories. Avengers, Age of Ultron. Similar type setup. You've got some ultimate power that was created and the ultimate power that was created is this, this being, this digital being called Ultron. And he's actually created to be a peaceful being and to cause peace in the universe. What is this? Hello, I am Jarvis. You are Ultron, a global peacekeeping initiative designed by Mr. Stark. This feels wrong. I'm a peacekeeping program created to help the Avengers. I don't get it. The mission. Give me a second. Peace in our time. Peace in our time. Once again, another parallel that's happening here. On that poster, um, since Iron Man is the one like Christ, look at his hands. Exactly. And, and he has something on his hands. Wow. I mean, that's something I didn't even notice before. But yeah, yeah you're no right. Heart. <laughs> he has these, these marks on his hands and he shoots light out of them. I mean, uh, we know Jesus will have the marks forever in his hands, even yeah. throughout eternity for us to remember that by. So yeah, very interesting that you pointed that out. So Ultron is the ultimate evil in this particular series. Here's when the Marvel characters are actually meeting Ultron for the first time. So question, Ultron is created a certain way. Yes. For peace becomes evil what's the explanation um that he basically uh saw everything that everyone was doing and he then thought that the path to peace was literally to exterminate these people so in other words he thought that he had a better way than the creator exactly just and like satan and very interesting that it's the Marvel Universe that created him. So that's a very Gnostic theme. Mm -hmm. When you have these, these demiurge, all these little sub-gods, and they created a god like Sophia, and mm -hmm. it was Sophia that was the evil god and was mm -hmm. the one that was cast out, they're flipping the model upside down. This is coming at you from a very Gnostic perspective. Mm -hmm. So here they're meeting Ultron for the very first time, and listen to the verbiage that is even used in this scene. I'm on a mission. What mission? Peace in our time. I'm on a mission. Peace in our time. Mm. So his ultimate goal is to create peace. How could you be worthy? You're all killers. And his pathway to peace, he believes, is to wipe out anybody that is fighting on the other side of the fence, right? Now, why is that significant in a Christian worldview? Christ is going to come back with fire and destroy the wicked and reset up a kingdom of perfection, right? Because just like Ultron, right here, right? Sin is infectious, infecting the entire universe, right? So how's God going to deal with it? Destroy it. He's going to destroy it, right? That is a crazy parallel that is happening even in here. Interesting, like I'm assuming these are his warriors that are crashing through and it's like everybody winds up looking like Iron Man. You know, it's like they're created in that image. Like this is as good as it can get. You know, you, you're duplicating that model. Right. There's a lot of biblical terminology that is thrown out here and you will see this, but I wanna to read to you. Psalms 85, eight says, I will listen to what God the Lord says. He promises peace to his people and his faithful servants, right? The Bible describes God as, as, as being the instigator of peace, right? We're engaged in a war. We know that there's obviously a battle going on, but God is the God of peace. So listen to how the Avengers um, talk with Ultron, and you'll start to hear some biblical terminology. How is humanity saved if it's not allowed to evolve? There's only one path to peace. The Avengers' extinction. Had strings, but now I'm free. So, an interesting scene. He's basically saying there's one path to peace the extinction of this group that's kind of like the rebels, right? So to say. And they kill him, he dies, but really he goes into everyone else. Now, 
speaking Christianity, right? God is literally, he died, but he literally is going into his followers, right? We're supposed to open our hearts and invite Jesus into our lives. So once again, another interesting kind of parallel. Ultron says something right here in this scene that you might find very biblical. Upon this rock, I will build my church. So <laughs> upon, oh. upon this rock, you will, I will build my church. Fit in this movie. Right? Who said that? Yeah. Who said yeah. that? Jesus Christ. Jesus. Jesus Christ, right? And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So very interesting, the very line that Jesus uses is used here. And Ultron meets up with his people that he's trying to deceive um, that are, are part of the Avengers side, and they're meeting in a church. Very interesting, mm -hmm. right? Did you know this church is in the exact center of the city? The elders decreed it so that everyone could be equally close to God. I like that. The geometry of belief. Very interesting. Wow. He's sitting on a throne in the very center of church. And that... What's on his head? And that's how you get close to God. He's kind of got like a towel shawl thing over his head. Almost like a Jews. Right? You know, very interesting, sitting on a throne. Um, so, listen to the language that's still being used. Is that why you've come? To end the Avengers? I've come to save the world. But when he's asked, why have you come? Literally come, right? He was created, remember? But, but why have you come? That's language that's used in heaven. And he says, I've come to save humanity. That's the very idea of Jesus, right? Yeah. In fact, the devil doesn't want to save you. He wants to destroy you. So you can't fit that model into the devil. Now, this particular character, his name is Vision, and the Avengers also create him. They give him life. Listen to the language that's, that's used in this particular scene when he meets the Avengers for the first time. You think I'm a child of Ultron? You're not? I'm not Ultron. I'm not Jarvis either. I am. Kind of interesting that mm -hmm. here once again we see the same phrase, I am, and you'll notice this kind of pop up with a lot of them, right? Yeah. What is I am? It's God. The name of God, right? When Moses asked, what am I supposed to call you? He said, I am that I am, right? Mm -hmm. And so, here he's saying, I'm not a child of Ultron. Listen to the verbiage that's used there, right? We are the children of God. I mean, even the way that they refer to people who follow Ultron is like what God's call followers are called, right? So also here he's sitting there describing what the plan of action is to beat Ultron. Now, I find this very interesting. Listen to this. I don't want to kill Ultron. He's unique. And he's in pain. But that pain will roll over the earth, so he must be destroyed. Every form he's built, every trace of his presence on the net. So, what did you just hear? He didn't want to destroy him. He wants to destroy everything that he stands for. The image of him, right? He wants to utterly change every form, every thought, every idea because that's the ultimate way to destroy someone, right? Even if they're there in your presence, but to destroy who that image is to people, that's the best way to beat them. Because it turns yeah. your opinion of them, like, so now the whole world is coming against this person because they believe that their character is twisted, you know? But it's exactly like what the devil is doing with God, right? Yeah, in the exactly. dark ages, the devil knew the more Christians he killed, the more they popped up, right? So all of a sudden he goes, well, I can't just kill them because all of a sudden they're repopulating like crazy. Mm -hmm. What I can do is destroy the image of God in them. And he's taken over Christianity and twisted it, right? Yeah. So I found this pretty interesting that this is literally the devil's plan to destroy God's image in your life. Now, listen to this even. When the earth starts to settle, God throws a stone at it. And believe me, he's winding up. What? He said God throws a stone at it? So he's referring to a prophecy. Okay. I mean, that's what happens in Daniel. 
you know, there's a, a great stone, like a mountain, that comes and destroys the image that Nebuchadnezzar dreamed about, and, and God set up his, that was representative of God's kingdom being set up on earth. So it will literally, that, I mean, prophecy, literally yeah. being spoken right here, saying that a stone is going to come and destroy this kingdom, right? But I found it kind of interesting because, you know, all these little phrases and everything, these words all go into everyone's mind. Mm -hmm. In fact, that was the whole reason we made that documentary about how your mind works called pseudology, right? If you understand how the brain works and you sit in a dark room in a theater and open your mind as wide as you can open, you, all those words go in there and they stay in there, but you don't think about them. So putting words in people's minds that go and view these movies saying that, you know, God's just gonna throw a stone at you and destroy you, is a slam on God once again, right? Now, once again, you'll see more biblical imagery here. You think you're saving anyone? I turned that key and dropped this rock a little early and it's still billions dead. Even you can't stop that. This is the best I can do. This is exactly what I wanted. All of you against all of me. How can you possibly hope to stop me? So, interesting, right? He's literally saying, you guys against me, how do you hope to stop me? And we saw in that other previous clip, right? They wanted to destroy his image, but listen to um, the end of this film, what he is basically describing when he comes to destroy the world, what people are, are looking for. What are they doing when they're looking up in the sky in the end of the world? Listen to this verbiage. I was meant to be beautiful. The world would have looked to the sky and seen hope, seen mercy. Instead, they'll look up in horror because of you. So, when he comes to destroy the world, people will be looking up into the sky for hope and mercy. That's the very, like, mm -hmm thing that the Christian church has been longing for since the beginning of time, right? Yeah. And here's the scene in the very end when he literally is like in a second coming pose over hovering over the world and listen to what he says to the people. Come to confess your sins. I don't know how much time you got. More than you. Uh, have you been juicing? This is how you end, Tony. This is peace in my time. Do you see the beauty of it? The inevitability? You rise only to fall. Isn't this interesting? You rise only to fall, right? Mm -hmm. What's gonna happen with the people at the end of the world? They're gonna rise up. Yeah. And? Not to fall. <laughs> but literally in the very end, after Satan sits there for a thousand years thinking uh, about what he's done, yeah. the people will be resurrected and literally get a chance to see why they weren't allowed to come to heaven, yeah. only to fall again, yeah. right? Yeah. Very typical, even he's in this Christ-like pose looking down on the people. You know what's funny, is it a slam if it's true? Like all these parallels to the Bible and it, it's painting in the light of like, this is gonna happen, this is true. It is true. But he is Except the at guy. the end, it's kind of twisted where the person who has the figure of God falls, whereas the rebellion wins, which is incorrect from the biblical standpoint. Right. Um, but I just find it interesting going right. through all of it, it's all true. Right, you know what I mean? They're using biblical truth, but they're just flipping the, the characters around, who's the good guy, who's the bad guy, and they're just confusing you, but literally they're telling you the truth of what's going on. That's why I found this so fascinating when it kind of really wrapped my head around this 10-year venture that Marvel did. It's been a decade of signs and wonders. And the end game is paralleling what the Bible's telling us is gonna happen in the end. That's what's crazy. Yeah, because the viewer wants that guy defeated. That's right. Yeah. He wants right. the judge or whatever. He wants the ones that they're gonna rise and fall. We wanna defeat the one who's gonna do that. That's right, that's right. So let's talk about Black Panther for a second. This was a massive movie. We made a documentary specifically centered around this film and um, there was a lot of spiritualism in this movie, but once again, he's on the side of the Avengers, right? So we thought it would be appropriate to, to discuss him in this context. Um, 
In the very beginning of the Black Panther, it's describing how he became the Black Panther. A warrior shaman received a vision from the panther goddess Bust, who led him to the heart-shaped herb, a plant that granted him superhuman strength, speed, and instincts. The warrior became king and the first Black Panther. What's a shaman? It's like a witch doctor type. Witch doctor, right? Someone who uses witchcraft and sorcery. Mm -hmm. And so he meets a witch doctor, someone who has sorcerous powers, and he goes and talks with Bast, an ancient Egyptian cat god, who gives him a piece of fruit to give him superpowers. Now, I can think of another story where a animal told you to eat a piece of fruit to give you superpowers. What's that? That's a serpent, yeah. That's the devil. I mean, literally right here, every single Christian should have walked out of the movie right here and said, hey, that's the story of the devil. But nonetheless, a lot of people st stuck around. Bast is the ancient Egyptian cat god. Um, and even on Marvel's website, it talks about uh, in this necropolis, the city, the Wakandan city of the dead, right? What does necro mean? Dead. 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 Polis means city. city. So in the city of the dead, that's where the Black Panthers go to die. When you rule, there's the king of the dead. I mean, this is like the king of the dead. It even says he's an unconquered king of kings, lord of lords. I mean, those are names that are reserved for God. Yep. Yet he's the king of the dead. God is not the king of the dead. He's the king of the living. That's why they call him the living God. So this is opposite of God, right? Isaiah 8, 19 through 20 tells us, if we're gonna look at the world through biblical eyes, to the law and to the testimony, if it speaks not according to this word, it is because there's no light in them, right? It has to line up with the Bible, otherwise it's not worth your time. That's basically what that's saying. So let's talk about um, when he meets the, uh, his father, who's dead, and he uh, goes through a ritual that sends him into this space where he can then go talk to the dead uh, panthers. And in here, we have the panther sitting inside of the tree, and as he approaches the tree, the panther comes down and talks with him. I find it, once again, very interesting that we have a tree and an animal coming down to give you a piece of advice out of that tree. <laughs> I'll let you sit and think on that for a little bit. Leviticus 26, though, says, And the soul that turneth after such that have familiar spirits, after wizards, to go a-whoring after them, I will set my face against that soul and cut him off amongst his people. Listen, witchcraft and sorcery is a very serious matter in the Bible. Yep. You do not, as a Christian, want God to tell you he's going to set his face against you. God is very merciful. He is very patient. But there are things that will push him past that mercy and patience. Witchcraft, look at the stories in the Bible. Turn through and just read the chapters that happened in the Old Testament. Anyone that constantly struggled with witchcraft and sorcery, they were literally sent out of the camp and God said, this is severe enough. Don't even have them around you. Take them outside. Put them outside of your group. The and, Witch of Endor story. Yeah. In most cases, put to death. Put to death, right? That's how serious it was in the Bible. So it, I believe it's as serious then as it is now for us. So anything with witchcraft and sorcery, turn it off. Don't even watch it, right? In the comic book for Black Panther, here's Black Panther talking with Bast. That's, that's closer to Baphomet. I mean, literally he's going and meeting with Baphomet to become the Black Panther. And as he meets with this Bast god, that's where Bast tells him you're going to be the king of the dead. And Bast um, talks to him and says this line that we read from earlier that you will be uh, with all of the, uh, the past panthers when they go to die. You'll be a crowned and unconquered king of kings. I mean, those names that are only reserved for God. He opens up Black Panther's third eye and that's what really gives him the, the power to be the Black Panther. And then here's the Black Panther. Um, totally talking to all of the other dead Black Panthers to give them uh, counsel. He says, hey, listen, I call upon the name of Bast. I call upon you for counsel. We're never supposed to call upon the spirits, right? There's tons of examples in the Bible where people called upon the spirits and it was disastrous. Leviticus 19.31 says, do not turn to mediums or necromancers to seek after them and to make yourselves unclean by them. I am the Lord your God. The Bible is very clear on necromancy, speaking to the dead, sorcery, witchcraft, any of that kind of stuff. It says that it will make you unclean. Mm -hmm. 
And if you're a Christian seeking for Christ's righteousness, this is not something that you even want to observe in a film. Yeah. Now, I find it very interesting that after the um, Black Panther goes and speaks to um, that Bass looking character, uh, Bass tells him that there's coming days, a great fire in the sky. And you know, it's like a fire in the sky that's coming to destroy the world. Looks very much like a second coming, but yeah. from an evil perspective, right? And it says the great fire will bring about a great flood and the Wakandan walls will break. The city of the dead will fall. And that's what the Bible talks about. Revelation, you know, Babylon will fall. Yeah. There will be a time that this happens. So once again, very interesting parallel. Doctor Strange, of course, just even analyzing the surface of this film, his superpower is black magic, right? That's why they call him the black magician. Mm. He, he is very uh, much engaged in witchcraft, sorcery, divination, all of those things that the Bible strictly speaks against. But here's what black magic means. Magic invoking the supposed invocation of evil spirits for evil purposes. Now, if he's the master of the dark arts, he's the master at invoking evil spirits. For evil purposes. For evil purposes. Uh, yeah. He's literally the one that is on the Avengers side, right? So you can start to see that all of these characters, like the um, Guardians of the Galaxy, they're the th criminals and the thieves. They're the black magic sorcerers. They're the um, Black Panther, kings of the dead. Those are all attributes of Satan or his government. Thor who's cast out of heaven. Thor who's cast out of heaven, right? It's kind of interesting. I know we bring up in one of our documentaries, I think it's Replacement Gods too. Um, Doctor Strange's lair is called the Sanctum Sanctorum, which is Latin for Holy of Holies, which is where God is supposed to dwell, the Holy of Holies, you know? Right, and that there's evil invocations of evil spirits being invoked in the sanctuary, I mean, that's just twisted in and of itself. But yes, Deuteronomy 18, 10 through 12 gives us a picture of what sorcery and witchcraft is to God. There shall not be found among you anyone that makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire or useth divination or observer of times or an enchanter or a witch or a charmer or a consulter with familiar spirits or a wizard or a necromancer. For all that do these things are a what? Abomination. Abomination to the Lord. What does the word abomination mean? It's um, something that God hates. Hates. Mm. Literally, the word abomination is the strongest language that God could use to say, I hate this thing. So how is it that we can watch movies with things that are clearly an abomination to God? What about Captain Marvel? So we're seeing a common thread run through here, right? Here, Captain Marvel, the person that she's fighting against, the evil villain in her story, is known as the Supreme Intelligence, okay? So there, here is something that's very interesting as well. Who is the Supreme Intelligence in the universe? God. He is the one that is the top of the food chain everywhere, right? He's known as the most wise being, looking at it and judging it from a Christian perspective, but this, they make this person evil. And in the film, Captain Marvel, she doesn't really have a form, and if you look at the comic books, there are all sorts of different interpretations. She can kind of manifest herself in different forms, um, which I think is very interesting because no man has seen God, right? Yeah. So here, Captain Marvel is having a discussion with the Supreme Intelligence. Listen to the verbiage that's even used here. Zeers. Intelligence. Your commander insists that you're fit to serve. I am. So. Once again, we say, we see that one of the Avengers is describing herself and she says, I am, and it just stops, right? I find that very interesting that they keep writing that into the dialogue. So let's talk about the whole pinnacle of this whole series, which really kind of started coming to a culmination in um, Avengers Infinity War. You have this being called Thanos, who's the most evil character in the whole universe. He's the most powerful character in the whole universe. Thanos is one of the darkest characters in the Marvel Universe. A character who can take on the entire Marvel Universe with a grin. There's something really arch-villain about that. 
and he's specifically running throughout the universe and collecting stones that will give him that ultimate supreme power to be able to snap his fingers and wipe out half of the universe. And each one of these stones gives him a different superpower. And I'll tell you what, each, what some of the stones mean and you can see that there's some very strange parallels to God. One of the stones gives him the ability to have control over space and time. One of them gives them control to create life out of nothing, to bend and warp reality. One of the stones gives him the ability to raise people from the dead. I mean, these are, these are attributes that are literally only attributed to God. And so as he gets these um, stones and get, they give him ultimate supreme power in the universe, he is going to snap his fingers and destroy half of the world. And the Avengers are trying to stop that. So in this scene, the Avengers have never actually seen the Guardians of the Galaxy um, characters yet. And so this is the first time that they've, they've run into the Guardians of the Galaxy. And they're talking about whose side are you on? Listen to the language that they use. Dan, all right, let me ask you this one time. What master do you serve? What master do I serve? What am I supposed to say, Jesus? Oh, by the way, that's, I find, extremely blasphemous, yeah. right? It's like, yeah. oh, it's a joke? Like, what am yeah. I supposed to say? I serve Jesus? Like, uh, yes, if you're a Christian, you serve Jesus, and he died for you to have an opportunity. <clears throat> to passively throw this into a movie, I believe that's taking the Lord's name in vain. Here's an interesting side note. Chris Pratt was awarded at the MTV Movie Awards, goes up front, and is extremely open about his Christian beliefs. And he says this. You have a soul. Be careful with it. God is real. God loves you. God wants the best for you. Believe that. I do. Learn to pray. It's easy and it's so good for your soul. Nobody is perfect. People are gonna tell you you're perfect just the way you are. You're not. You are imperfect. You always will be, but there is a powerful force that designed you that way. And if you're willing to accept that, you will have grace. And grace is a gift. And like the freedom that we enjoy in this country, that grace was paid for with somebody else's blood, do not forget it. Don't take it for granted. Now why I find that interesting is because he was in the Lego movie as the voice of Emmett. If you haven't seen this, you gotta look at our LED on the whole Lego deception. But it was another attack against God. And here is an actor who's been part of the Guardians of the Galaxy, which is an attack on God, and the Lego movie, which is an attack on God. And yet he is not shy about his Christian beliefs and he still does not see it for what it is. That's how deceptive this stuff really is. So I'm a, I'm offended by this really kind of thing. Can't even, I, I challenge people, watch a movie and not hear Christ's name blaspheme. I mean, it's in every movie now. Right? It seems like every single movie breaks one of the commandments, right? Yeah. And, and because we hear it so often, it's not, we're not sensitive to it anymore. Yeah. So anyway, here's a scene um, with Thanos. And uh, listen to the language that's used in this. There are two more stones on Earth. Find them, my children, and bring them to me on Titan. Father, we will not fail you. If I might interject, if you're going to Earth, you might want to guide. So what do you notice out of a scene like this? How did he address the people? It's his children. And they addressed him as? Father. Father. Down, down to him. Yeah, so these are names and things that are attributed to God and his characters, right? Mm -hmm. Children, I mean, you never hear the Avengers talk about children to anyone that like follows them, right? Yeah. Because that's a name that, that literally in the Christian world is attributed to followers of Christ. So here he's talking with Loki. He ends up killing Loki. And while he's killing him, Loki says something very interesting to him. <laughs> He said, you will never be a god. 
And remember, all the Avengers, they consider themselves to be gods, right? I mean, they're always asked about their godlike powers, or they are gods, or they're self-proclaimed gods. Or I mean, there's no doubt. I mean, that's mythology. That's mythology. Right? Loki, okay, too. Exactly. So they're basically like throwing it in God's face. This would be a description of God and saying that you are never going to be a god, mm -hmm. right? Not the god, a god. So I found this very interesting. Here's another I am that pops up in the scene that Thanos meets the Avengers. Listen to how he describes he is coming and he describes himself as the I am. If I ask you to what end? Dread it, run from it, destiny arrives all the same. And now it's here, or should I say, I am. The fact that they highlight it like that tells me that that's so purposeful. Yeah. Because really, he is the real I am. All the other ones are counterfeits, literally, of God, right? But in this story, he's in gold, he's the strongest character, he has the ability to wipe out the half the universe. Let me ask you a question. Does Satan have the ability to wipe out any of the part of the universe? He probably would have already if he did. That's right. Yeah. Only God has the ability to cause a worldwide flood, right? No. Or allow it to happen or wipe it out. That's God's power. We know God's holding back the winds, you know, so he can only do as much as God will allow. That's right. But even in the end, when he lets the winds go, the devil is not allowed to kill God's people during that yep. time. So the power is literally in God's hands that has that ability to begin with. So that was very interesting that he says that. Now here's a scene with Thanos and his daughter. He takes children uh, from all the planets that he's basically taken over and he's wiped out half of their existence. He basically takes um, children from there. And this is a scene between him and his daughter Gamora and notice how she goes and looks at his throne and she says, I hate that thing. Listen to this. I always hated that chair. So I've been told. Even so, I'd hope you'd sit in it one day. I hated this room. This ship. I hated my life. So he's basically taking her um, um, back to where he kind of like rules from um, generally and that's why she's having this conversation with him and it's she's in it's in his ship I think and that's why she says I hated that ship I hated the chair I hated all these so things he right? wants her to take over after he's gone to exactly he wants her to rule right so the ship that she mentions in this is the ship that he comes to destroy the world in and it's called the sanctuary too uh, the sanctuary is weird. a thing that's attributed to God, right? Yeah, and this is like the I am who's giving his giving his position to his, his daughter, you know, his descendant. That's right. The Sanctuary 2 is a massive warship, play on words, warship, right. like worship, right? And that's what he's coming to destroy the world. But here he's having a conversation with some of the Avengers, and listen to how he describes when he destroys half the world, what is he going to do after that? With all six stones, I could simply snap my fingers. They would all cease to exist, and I call that mercy. So, he calls destroying half of the universe what? Mercy. Mercy, mercy right? And so, that's, that's, that's not something that you hear attributed to the devil or his team, yeah. right? It's always attributed to God. God is the merciful one. But he's saying that wiping half the people out is, is mercy, Which right? Which I believe, you know, God is going to destroy the wicked because who wants to live for eternity in a world full of rapists, murderers, you know? It's mercy on his children. He's it, saving us from those people. That's right. It's merciful for you to not live in a life of sin forever. Here he's having a conversation with Doctor Strange, and Doctor Strange asks him what he's going to do. And then what? I finally rest and watch the sunrise on a grateful universe. The hardest choices require the strongest wills. So after he destroys the world, what happens? He rests. He rests. He rests. What happens when God does come at his second coming and destroys sinful humanity? 
Yeah, on your time of rest. There's a time of rest that happens after that. So that's very interesting. There's also another story parallel um, to God, and this story is when Thanos is looking for one of these uh, infinity stones, and he gets one from this guy here, and in order to get the stone, he has to sacrifice one of his children. The stone demands a sacrifice. Of what? In order to take the stone, you must lose that which you love. A soul for a soul. Don't you find it interesting that the sacrifice, he's basically saying something that is so true. Sin requires a penalty to be paid for that sin, right? And here, God sacrificed his own son to pay that penalty for you and me. And who does he end up sacrificing? His daughter. Uh, I'm saying like, it's almost like this psychological warfare because when you see these characters, instantly you think, oh, bad guy, cloak, looks like a skull, a grim reaper. Looks you know? like death. Yeah, so if you're just watching with your eyes, you're seeing bad guys, good guys, but God does not judge on the outward appearance, he judges on the heart, the character. So if you if you were just to say, who said I that who said I am the I am? Who can destroy the universe? Who's gonna sacrifice a son? All these characteristics, attributes, people would say, Oh, that's God. But it's painted where you're seeing it as the enemy. So you know what's kind of crazy is in this scene where he actually throws his daughter off and destroys her for because he wants the power to be able to destroy half of the planet. So it's not that he literally uh, uh, does it because he's like loves everybody, right? He believes that this is the only path to be able to make the universe go forward. And so he, he like does it in a cold-hearted manner. All my life, I dreamed of a day, a moment, when you got what you deserved. You kill and torture, and you call it mercy. The universe has judged you. You failed. And do you want to know why? Because you love nothing, no one. Tears. They're not for him. No. This isn't love. I ignored my destiny once. Isn't that crazy? Oh. So if they set this up to be a character like God, he heartlessly doesn't care. He's gonna destroy half the universe. He calls it mercy, but yet everyone else that's viewing him is like, you don't care about anything. Mm. Listen, God sent Jesus down here to die. Your sin, my sin, mm -hmm. because he wouldn't spare even the littlest thing in heaven. He gave us the greatest thing in heaven so that you yeah. and I could have that opportunity. So opposite of what they're saying right here. I mean, this is like literally, if you asked Satan, what's the war in heaven like? This is exactly how he'd answer it. You yeah. are the cold hearted one. The world and the universe has judged you and found that you love nothing. Yeah. No, that love was proven in the palm of Christ's hands as he hung on the tree. It was Satan that put him there yeah. and he didn't deserve it. Moreover, Jesus was willing to do that for us. Yeah. There seems to be a lot of animosity between this father and, and the daughter. Gonna sacrifice you, he doesn't care, he's not crying for you, that tear is not for you. That is a slam on God yeah. right there. And so as a viewer, like you said, Kendi, as a viewer, you watch this and you go, yeah, he's evil, Thanos is evil. And you know what, that's exactly what I found on the internet. I read article after article about um, atheists that were literally saying Thanos is the most evil character in the world and if Thanos is like a god I would never serve that type of god and that's what that's what atheists are literally saying right yeah. Yeah. and so here is a a flipping of that idea and you as a viewer they psychologically rope you in to try and understand from Thanos's perspective but the end game of what you just watched right there is that you're going to hate him Every atheist I talked to 
this is the way they see God. Yep. They don't see him in his true character. They've been seeing this all their life, yep. and it's, the seed is planted. Yep. There's a reason why they call this programming, right? Yeah. This is a program that's programming your brain yeah. to literally fight and hate God. Yeah. Yep. So that was the Infinity War. Thanos ends up in the end of Infinity War. He snaps his fingers. Half of everybody dies. So it's like this end of the world scene where people are just dissipating off into the dust of the world, right? And then, literally, this blew my mind. Endgame steps on the scene. And this is the trailer to Endgame. The very first words that come out of Tony Stark's mouth are this. like a thousand years ago I fought my way out of that cave became Iron Man a thousand <laughs> years ago it seems like a thousand years why not 1500 years right. why not 600 years why not 800 years why do they have to use a number that literally describes how Satan will sit here by himself thinking of what he did for that thousand years and then it takes place after everybody's already gone. It's like they picked up the story, second coming comes, everybody dies, right? And then now they're picking it up after that thousand years is up. And the roles are reversed. You know, he had the attributes of Christ, but he's the one that's stuck on earth for a thousand years. It's like Revelation 20, yeah. verse seven. Mm -hmm. After the thousand years have expired, Gog and Magog come together for the battle of the great day of the God Almighty, right? And literally, that's where this story is, is picking up. You see, if you understand where the war between God and Satan started, you can start to begin to wrap your head around what's really truly going on. In Ezekiel 28, 16 through 17, it talks about Lucifer. This is a prophetic uh, speech about Lucifer, and it says, By the multitude of thy merchandise they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I cast thee out as profane out of the mouth of mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Now question, what is a covering cherub? Angel who stood in the presence of God, or who does stand in the presence of God. And that is symbolized by what? The Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant, right? When we had the Ark of the Covenant, those angels whose wings touched over the top of it were the, called the covering cherubs. And what's inside of the Ark of the Covenant? Yeah, to make commandments. It was Aaron's rod that butted and a bowl of manna. That's right. So um, all of a sudden, we have these angels that are literally hovering over, protecting the law of God. In fact, it was the very job of the covering cherub in heaven was, was to, to share with the world what the character of God was like. That's why Satan was so damaging when he went around to all the evil angels and he told them, you know what, God's really not very loving. He's not really nice. They believed him because why? The covering cherub is next to God. So as they sat there and, and, and listened to this person, they would say, hey, well, wouldn't you know what God's really like? You're, you're the one that stands next to him. He was like an insider whistleblower. He was an insider, and that's mm -hmm. why he was so effective to bring all the angels with him when he did. Isaiah 14, 12 through 14 says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will extend my throne upon the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend into the heights of the clouds, and I will be like the Most High. Now, this makes me question, if Satan is saying he wants to be like the Most High, what's God like? God is love. Right? In fact, that's what the Bible describes God as. So Satan is literally saying, I can be love or loving just like you, but I don't need to follow your rules, God. And obviously we can see what, what has happened since then. The word devil in Greek, diablos, means to accuse or bring charges with hostile intent. That's what the word devil means, to accuse. The word Satan in the Greek, satanas, means adversary or slanderer. The word widespread trade that was used in Ezekiel 28, 16, it's called rekula, literally means to traffic, merchandise, or peddle 
And that's exactly what the devil's doing. He's peddling lies about God. When you look at the word peddling in the dictionary, it means to travel about and sell something or to engage in the illicit sell of narcotics, to travel about selling wares or to occupy oneself with trifles. Literally, the devil is peddling lies about God and he's been doing it from the beginning. So I find it very interesting that Revelation 12, 10 describes Satan as this. I heard with a loud voice saying in heaven, now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before God day and night. You see, the devil only has one trick. In this war between God and Satan, the devil has one trick and every single thing fits under that one trick. And the one trick that he does literally is to represent the character of God in a false light. He can only t attack God and attack who he is and attack what he's like. And so this war is being played out so that the whole entire universe will say, God is a loving and righteous judge or, like Satan says, they will believe the lies that are told against God. This Marvel Universe that everyone is obsessed with, I mean, $1.2 billion in a few days is so mind-boggling. But you know what? It's the devil's Bible. It's literally the devil's story on what's going on between the war between God and Satan, and it just makes a lot of sense to me why the world gravitated towards it. Everyone's listening to the lies that the devil is telling. Well, there's a common question. You know, we're looking at this through the eyes of, of the Bible. We're, we're Christians. Um, but do you really think, you honestly think that the directors of this film all sat together in a room and said, hey, you know, let's attack God, let's attack Christianity and, and formulate this story to kind of influence and program people against God? Okay, so in, in the, uh, Infinity War. There is a um, menu uh, on the DVD. If you buy the DVD, the Blu-ray DVD, there's actually a whole commentary between the directors. And in that commentary, the directors themselves said that Thanos is a godlike character that has a messianic complex. Hmm. hmm. You don't use those kind of words or that kind of terminology unless you know something, literally. Even if they don't know what's going on, right? We know that God can suggest things to us just like the devil can suggest things to us. So I believe that if people are opening themselves up to the spirit world, right? The devil can come in and give them ideas and they can go, oh wow, I came up with this really great idea for a Marvel cinematic character, right? And it has all this common congruent, you know, uh, common denominators with God, right? But maybe they didn't sit around and just say, hey, I think that's God. When Jesus told the story about casting the demon out of the man's mind and the, the demon went away and the man swept up his mind and he came back and checked on the man and he found that the man had left his house empty, wasn't filled. Then the demon went out and he got seven more unclean spirits and he came back and the man was worse off than he was before. What that tells me is we are empty vessels. You're either filled with the Spirit of God or if you're empty, you open yourself up for the devil to come in and the devil's not going to knock on the door of your heart and say, excuse me, can I come in? He's just going to come right in. He's going to bring his friends. They're going to post up and have a great time in your mind, right? So I think that these people that are coming up with some of these storylines maybe don't realize they're being used by the devil and that's why we see this common denominator. But my question to them would be, if there's 101 million things to talk about, why are you always gravitating towards this? Why does every evil character share a common trait with God? Why is there always biblical language in why all your is there movies? Biblical language? Yeah. Why on this rock I will build my church? Why, yeah. why would you even say that in right the line? Caesar. And, and the directors, a lot of them say, uh, I got this script from a dream, a vision, you know? And then like Grant Morrison and the other guy, they were, I mean, Grant Morrison, he's, into the magic. He's like making symbols and sitting in the middle of them and telling them that 
telling people that demons are telling me to write this stuff. I mean, that's right. That's right. Yeah. And it's not like they're using the Quran or the Bhagavad Gita or any right. other ancient right. text. Why doesn't he use Muslim words? Yeah. Why doesn't he use, you know, like some Buddha words or whatever? Like, you know, it's like they're, they're literally using the words that are attributed to God or Jesus said or whatever. And, and it, to me, that's just twisting the idea of who God is. You'd have to be pretty ignorant to think that it's all just coincidence or pointless. That's right. That's right. And I mean, when you see it even outside of let's say um, this world like the Marvel Universe, like the one we did on Star Wars, right? Um, you can look it up on YouTube, see our video on Star Wars. You'll see the exact same formula that's being used. There is common traits that, that are between God and Satan, and they're just tr flipping the idea where God is evil and Darth Vader is the evil one, but yet he's more like Jesus than he is like the devil would be like Darth Vader. So. You know, these things I think are slid in these movies for a reason, and I think there's a reason why we're pointing these out and saying, listen, you've got to know the truth. The only way you can spot these things is by studying the truth. You're not gonna sit down and watch a movie like this and be all of a sudden like, I know what the truth is and I can see everything that they're doing unless you have a relationship with God. And once you do, you hear buzzwords like that, like I'll build my house upon this rock, then all of a sudden you're like, hey, wait, I remember that from my Bible and you know what the truth is. And you'll finally, I believe, get to the point where, well, I don't wanna watch a movie yeah. that slams my God. I don't want to. Why would I want to do that? Even if it's cool, I, I could find better ways to spend my time. Yep. So. What do you guys think the end result is for the Christian and non-Christian? Why, why do you think Hollywood is pushing these particular themes over and over and over again? You wanna know what the end result is? This is the end result right here, okay? 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 through 12 says this, The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance to how Satan works. Now pause. What does it mean to be lawless? A, a rebel against God's commands. Not follow the laws, right? Yeah. So we know that the Bible speaks that there will be a time in the end where a lawless one will be in accordance to how Satan operates. What they're doing is they're setting people up. There is a division that is happening right here. You are either a follower of God or you will be a follower of Satan. There will be a time that there is no middle ground. Those wheat and those tares are growing up together. And I believe that separation is beginning to be seen now. So if you constantly watch erroneous things, you train your brain to focus on the errors or to digest the errors and not be able to discern truth. So listen to what the Bible says. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie and all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they, receive, they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. So how do people lose their salvation? They're not focused on the truth. Love the truth. They don't love the truth. Mm. So my idea is when you watch all of these errors all the time, you totally lose your discernment for truth. The devil's gonna step on the scene and deceive people. We know that prophetically from the Bible. In the end of the time, it's like his master opus plan is like one more last ditch effort to try to get as many people on his side as possible. And the people that get deceived, get deceived because they don't love the truth. The better you know the truth, the better you won't be deceived. For this is the reason that God sends them a powerful delusion that they will believe the lie. So God even has to allow this separation to happen. And so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth, but have delighted in wickedness. And let's be honest, don't these movies look wicked? Yeah. Isn't it full of wickedness? Killing, murder, you know, uh, uh, sexual immorality, you name it. All of that wickedness is in these movies. Why? They're getting darker and darker. They're getting darker and darker. And, and, and you know what's crazy is when I see little kids running around that have seen all these things. Yeah. Yeah. Dressed like the Black Panther. And... I believe it is high time. Know your master. Learn to have a relationship with Jesus. And how you do that is by studying and getting familiar with the very source of truth, the Holy Bible. Amen. Thank you guys for listening. 
I hope that this was beneficial to you. Uh, you know, leave a comment in here. We want to hear from you guys. We're excited to, to put this show out, LED Live. If you want to support us, check out our Patreon page. We've got a lot of cool perks out there. And uh, God bless you guys. And subscribe if you want to see more videos just like this.